thank my colleagues for agreeing to take a short break from their busy schedules today in order to sit down and share their personal thoughts and reflections with our good friends at the Historical Society of the Courts of the State of New York about the work of the Court of Appeals, how we carry out our business as judges, how we interact with each other, and what it's like to collectively decide the important and complex questions of law that routinely come before our state's highest court. up in a very large, warm, fun, wonderful Italian family. Um, my mom and dad and I, I'm an only child, lived in a multi-family house without my grandparents and my mom's brothers and sister and their children. So we all had this big familial thing going on there. And my mom and dad uh, were not formally educated. My dad did not pass the eighth grade and my mom didn't pass the 10th grade, um, but they knew intuitively about the power and the transformative power of education, and that's what they worked toward in our little family. I went to law school to become a prosecutor. Uh, the reason is because when I was about 12 years old, one of those cousins of mine who lived in the house with us got into very, very serious trouble with the law, he committed a very serious crime. And I was tasked to accompany his mom and dad to court. And honestly, when I watched that process unfold, and even though it was someone I loved very much, I just was in awe of the system. It was about accountability and fairness. And as I watched the prosecutor perform, particularly, not even the judge, the prosecutor perform, I thought to myself, oh, that's what I want to do. My first job out of law school was as an assistant district attorney in the Westchester County DA's office. Well, I grew up on the Lower East Side. I am first generation Puerto Rican born here. My family came from Puerto Rico, um, and we grew up uh, poor. I went to public school until the fifth grade, but my mother was very much committed to putting me in Catholic school, uh, which for us at the time was the private school that poor people could afford in the neighborhood. And it was a great education. Even though a New Yorker, I lived in my world. Uh, and so when I went to college, I went to Princeton, it was all very new and different and in many ways very uh, alien to me. Um, and so it was initially a difficult transition. Um, but I soon found my way. Uh, and it was a great experience. I had what I consider a pretty typical childhood, um, living with uh, two parents and two siblings in the suburbs. Education was a very important part of our upbringing. Both of my parents were professionals. They were both lawyers, as a matter of fact. It was uh, lively, and uh, there was a lot of conversation at the dinner table, and, and we were involved in all sorts of things. I'm the oldest of six. My dad was a police captain in the Buffalo Police Department, and my mom uh, worked a number of administrative jobs in the Board of Education. We all went to Catholic schools and then University of Buffalo for both undergraduate and law school. And after law school, then I also went and got a master's in uh, European history, sort of a labor of love. I grew up on Long Island in New York and went to public schools. Um, my parents also were New Yorkers, had grown up in Brooklyn, public schools didn't go to college, so I think uh, we were the first generation, I think, that at least went to college during the daytime. I'm the oldest of three. Uh, my parents were both teachers who worked for the state of California, which is where I grew up. Um, my mother was totally blind, and so as the oldest child, I had a lot of, you know, get her to various places, read uh, the side of a soup can to let her know was it tomato soup or cream of mushroom, the older child things. but sort of added on to that was that I was really, I functioned as her eyes. I was raised and uh, went to public schools on Long Island. Um, I was the middle of five children. Being the middle of five children actually teaches you something about negotiation and uh, forging consensus. After all, you have to figure out who's going to get the last yodel. <laughs> So 
here at the court, seniority is very much favored, but today we'll depart from that practice and we'll start with our newest associate judge, Paul Feynman. Judge, you came to us as a very experienced trial and appellate judge at the Intermediate Appellate Court, and now you're here at the state's high court. Tell us about your impressions about that transition, and I know there are obvious differences between the Intermediate Appellate Court and the Court of Appeals. Well, some of them are obvious, I think, uh, to practitioners such as I suddenly lost my interest of justice uh, jurisdiction. I mm -hmm. miss that uh, mm -hmm. at times. Um, and some are um, less obvious. Uh, the, the weight of knowing that you're not just resolving the dispute between the parties, but making a rule that is then going to be applied across the state for all cases going forward. And not only just across the state, but to the extent that we sometimes have certified questions uh, that is going to get applied uh, in federal court and then perhaps by federal courts across the country is a pretty waiting, uh, weighty proposition. So, Judge Wilson, you are a real student of the law, and as we all watched you uh, testify at your confirmation hearing, we heard you tell the committee that uh, in preparation for the, pro the selection process that you actually went back and read every Court of Appeals decision uh, back to 2013. So, what is it that you took from that exercise? Well, not enough, I think. Um, <laughs> I wanted to figure out what you guys did here. My practice has been mostly federal. And uh, I think why I say not enough was that that didn't give me really any insight into a couple of things, the most important of which were the leave grants. You can't really tell how much work goes into evaluating the cr criminal and civil leave applications here and how much back and forth there is about them. So uh, Judge Fahey recently said that he thought that if you were in another position that you would be a teacher. And so if there is one thing about the work of the court and you had the opportunity to educate the public about the work we do here, what would that be? Well, you were actually doing a lot of it, uh, which is one of the things that sort of warms my heart the most. When I see um, middle school or high school or college students here watching an argument and then we come off of the bench afterwards and explain who we are, where we came from, what we do, it humanizes the process. Thank you. So, Judge Garcia, uh, you came to us never having had an ex experience as either a trial or an appellate level judge, but you did come to us as a very muscular advocate, <laughs> having One served, sense. of course, as the United States Attorney for the Southern District, very important position, and uh, serving as a partner at Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, have you found the role transitioning from an advocate to a judge of the high court challenging, difficult, interesting, fun? <laughs> All of the above. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is so different, as you, as you point out, going from being an advocate and, and being on one side of the equation um, to, to, to judging. Um, and I find the biggest difference, because as you mentioned, I've had some roles where I'm in the public spotlight, the public role here, when you're on the bench and when you're in front of the advocates who are arguing, to me that was the biggest transition. And what's your favorite part of the piece of the work that we do here in terms of, is it the preparation, is it the oral argument, is it the conference, is it the writing of an opinion? It's definitely not the conference. No, it's, um, <laughs> I, I would say, I, I like the writing part mm -hmm. of this job. Um, you're writing such a different product. Again, you're using skills you've developed over your career as a lawyer, but you're producing something that's so different, as Judge Wilson was saying, you know, something that's lasting. So Judge Fahey. Judge. So we are a collegial court judge. And talk to us about the collegiality of this court. Is collegiality overrated? No, you have to drink a lot. It's the only thing that makes it tolerable to work with this people. Um, I played in bands when I was a kid, and playing music with other people was a very intimate experience. You don't, so don't always know the people that well. 
uh, and it takes a while and you have to develop a relationship with each other, but nonetheless you have to learn how to disagree with each other, uh, continue that intimate experience and move on to the next thing. And, and being on a pellet court is very much like that. It's a kind of a group of aging band members. Uh, and that intimacy, I think, that you have, um, and that ability to disagree is what makes for collegiality. It's not a job for people who can't compromise. However, to be successful at it, you have to decide what you think is important and, and fight for that. Um, if you do that, I think you have the respect of your colleagues, but you also develop friendships. We're is, lucky to have them. Is it hard for you to uh, come to an issue? And, you know, we're all strong personalities here. We have a view of life, of the law, and to round your edges to get to consensus? It, that took a while. Yeah. You know, you're taking a vote. You're not making a decision by yourself. And these are smart hard-working people with their own opinions and their own life experiences that they bring to the table. But like Paul said before, this is a high-wire act at the Court of Appeals, and it's a major challenge uh, for anyone who loves the law and cares about justice. It's a great opportunity uh, to step into history, and to make it happen, you have to work as a group. Judge Stein, you too came as a very experienced trial uh, appellate judge. Yes. Talk to us about the mechanics of the process. Well, I, I like uh, Judge Garcia, love the writing part of it, mm -hmm. but it really is the result of the entire process of decision making that we do and that, that we're here to do. The writing piece of it starts at the very beginning with, uh, with reading the briefs understanding the issues, uh, doing the research, uh, reading the record. Um, thank goodness we have brilliant and devoted and talented law clerks to help us with that process. And then we go into oral argument and questions are asked by both myself and my colleagues. Sometimes those answers might uh, make you lean a different way than you went in. And then after that, you come to conference, and whoever the judge reporting on the case is uh, uh, will then give their uh, proposal for how it is to be resolved. And again, we get to hear what each of the other judges thinks about the issues. And, and all of that is a process of formulating um, what is eventually going to go into a writing. And, and I will say that every single time that I review a writing, I find something that I want to change. And eventually I get to the point where I say, okay, this is it, I have to let it go. <laughs> and then it goes to my colleagues, and then they have at it. <laughs> they come back with their and comments. And they come back with their comments and suggestions. So it really it is a very well, thoroughly vetted, collaborative process in terms of what the public eventually reads. So... Our senior associate judge. Not an age. Not an age, <laughs> certainly not an age. <laughs> so what for you has been the most challenging aspect of your service here at the court? Well, it was interesting hearing what everyone else said before me. I, I would say the most challenging or the challenges of being on the court are also for me the most professionally satisfying and fulfilling. And it is, as we're saying, this, this um, dealing with complex legal issues, thinking critically about them, analyzing them, sometimes those cases are razor thin close, coming to a determination of how to resolve that issue, and then of course the writing process. So that's, that's of course this challenge of the work as a judge of the Court of Appeals. I would also add a of some of what's already been said, that because we are a collegial court, because it is, as, as some of you are calling it the, the public product or the product that the public sees, that opinion writing process is one where if I have a majority, my interest is not only speaking in my <coughs> own voice, but in speaking in the voice of the court. And so there is that challenge of how do I capture the concerns, the interests of my colleagues, as well as how am I representing the court as an institution. So I think those are all great and wonderful challenges. There's a familiarity to it as you do it over and over, but with each case there's a certain new wrinkle somewhere, which again is what makes the job so wonderful. Our um, goal and mission and devotion is to develop a strong and predictable body of law 
so that people can organize their professional and personal lives. It's an enormous responsibility and privilege. On the administrative side of my job, and um, uh, former Chief Judge uh, Kay was fond of saying it's really two full-time jobs at once, um, that is a equally important uh, piece of the work that the chief judge does. We are focused on what we're calling the Excellence Initiative, and uh, the goal of the Excellence Initiative is to make certain that every day we work toward achieving both operational and decisional excellence in every court throughout the state. On the high court, as they say, the buck stops here, and it's a legacy. It has lasting impact until Perhaps some court in the future decides otherwise. And so my role, of course, is, as it is with my colleagues, to do an excellent job and to get it right. But I also see my role as being that objective, neutral decision maker, that our communities can look up to our judiciary and the high court and say, without favor, cases are decided. It's not a popularity contest. It is looking at the law and deciding how the rule of law applies to a fact pattern. For me, it is about humanizing um, the role of even a high court judge and bringing it to, again, back to the people. Um, I love speaking with students, with, um, you know, with any, anybody that wants to hear about what we do and how we do it, um, because I think that um, hopefully, it will make them appreciate the process, the, the legal um, system, and maybe even encourage them to follow in my footsteps. Those words are the words that are, that are law, and that, that you have to be extremely careful and extremely precise. And of course, from experience writing lots of things, you know you can never do that perfectly. That there's always going to be some anticipated fact that shows up later, but that's why people describe the law as living. Uh, it's because things change and people can't predict the future. So uh, it, you want to be very careful. The satisfying part of that job is trying to craft something that will endure and that will set rules for people that, that you know, will have to be modified someday, but at least will, will provide a framework uh, that people can live by. I love what I do here, and, and for a number of reasons. One is the the day-to-day -day challenges, the intellectual challenges, you know, looking at the cases, determining the issues, trying to figure out positions and questions, and talking to your colleagues mm -hmm. about their points of view on, on the various issues and trying to come to some consensus and then mm -hmm. issuing this written product, mm -hmm. and, and then doing it the next day for a different issue. And, and that constant intellectual challenge I love. I get to come to this court every day and, and do the right thing mm -hmm. as I see it, mm -hmm. and that's an amazing place mm -hmm. to be. It's, it's a very fortunate place to be, and, and I appreciate that every day. I have found the people here at the Court of Appeals, the Brooklyn Central staff, and the, the, from everybody, from you know, the, the, the person who greets you in the morning when you walk in the door uh, to you know, the high-level clerks and uh, consultation clerks. Everyone is dedicated in a way that is just heartwarming and remarkable uh, to make sure that this court is worthy of having a reputation as the best state high court in the nation. Being on the Court of Appeals, you have an ability to speak to the future in a way that no other position in the judiciary allows you to do. Um, you, you don't, you're not resolving just individual disputes, but you're also speaking to the direction that the law is going to take, and as a result, the direction that our society is going to take. I don't view my role really here so much as an individual role, but more as part of an institution. By that we mean not some ephemeral idea uh, of uh, we're all friends together in a court. No, we're talking about something much more fundamental, which is the rule of law and how we govern ourselves. And the rule of law is a reflection of our ability to govern ourselves, not from uh, a religious philosophy or not from the power of a king, but 
arising out of our own democratic impulses to make decisions about what's best for our world and then to have those decisions implemented through law. We can fight about it, we can argue about it, but when the rules are made and the law is decided, we move forward from that.